why a conversation on ESG? You know, this is a topic that is super hot at the moment. You know, I looked at the Wall Street Journal this week, and this week alone, between Monday and Thursday, I counted 23 different articles, most of which were focused on the E aspect, a little bit on the S aspect or the G aspect, but they're out there everywhere. Um, you know, even today, there was an article from talking about the SEC easing the prospect for people to propose different proxies or different proposals for organization around environmental and social issues. Just, you know, we are a financial group, so we like our numbers. Just from a financial perspective, sales of green bonds have grown to 250 billion annually from approximately 50 billion in 2015. Investment banking fees on these green bonds are approximately 2.2 billion. COP26, which is going on this week, which is the UN Climate Change Conference that's going on in Glasgow. Parties to this agreement number 196 countries and the EU. So there's a million different topics going on about this. Every organization from Home Depot to JP Morgan to 1-800-Flowers needs to be thinking about ESG topics, what it means to their organization, and in some cases, organization needs to start thinking about what it means to their clients and from a product perspective. Um, so I'm super thrilled to introduce the panelists that we have here. I'd actually like to turn the floor over to them to them, for them to introduce themselves. Just a slight administrative perspective. In the case of Kristen, Ellie, and Alexandra, they will be talking about their own views on the topics we discuss, not necessarily their firm view. In the case of Linda, I think it will represent her firm view. With that, I will turn it over to the panelists. If you could introduce yourself, why don't we go in the order of Linda, Kristen, Allie, and Alexandra. So Linda, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Aaron. And hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me to join and thank you for Fang uh, for hosting this. Um, so I'm Linda Giuliano. I'm the founder of Bright World ESG. It's a consultancy that I started last year to partner with a variety of organizations to help embed principles of environmental, social and governance uh, practices into their business operations, into their company culture, uh, basically into the way that they operate um, as an organization. And prior to that, I spent three decades in asset management at Alliance Bernstein in a variety of operating roles, uh, where for the last decade, I built out the firm's platform for responsible investing. So thank you again, and I'll pass it on to the next person. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Aaron, and thank you all for being here. A pleasure to be speaking with you about such an important topic this afternoon. My name's Kristen Steigel. Um, I currently work at Allianz Global Investors. My past has been in asset management, focusing on different client channels, anywhere from institutional to retirement, sub-advisory and retail. Um, so looking forward to giving me my perspective from my view, sitting in a client facing seat. Hi everybody, I'm Allie Wright. Uh, I am also with Alliance Global Investors I've, with the risk management department, but I've been with the firm for 10 years. And over that time, I've worked also in learning and development and in legal and compliance. So it's interesting to kind of go from legal over to risk and see all the various different things that impact our firm and all the different things that you need to think about when implementing an ESG program. Uh, so looking forward to sharing my experience with you and also looking forward to hearing from other panelists and, and hopefully some good questions as well. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Erin, and to the FANG Network for having me here. Very excited to be discussing sustainable investing. I have been with the Alliance organization as well for nearly 10 years. Most recently, I am a member of the thematic equity team at Allianz, where we focus on investing in um, sustainable sustainable themes that align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I've been working closely with sustainability now for over five years and spend quite a bit of my time working on our water strategy and researching themes relevant to the water fund. So look forward to an exciting conversation today and hopefully some good questions as well. Thank you. 
Thanks, ladies. Um, now, I'm actually going to follow the lead of a dear colleague of mine who I've seen host events, and he always starts with a couple of icebreakers, and I think it's a way of just breaking the ice and humanizing us. So my first question to our panelists, maybe we can go in the same order, is what's your favorite podcast, streaming show, or other show or movie at the time, at the moment? So Linda, to you first. I know, I'm not sure that that's a fair question to have a favorite because I think I've actually become a podcast junkie since I stopped commuting into the city. So in the morning now I put on my headset and I go out and I walk for an hour and I, I listen to a variety of podcasts. But I guess for general business information, I like The Economist and NPR News Now. And then for fun, I've been listening a lot to Coffee Break Italian. Um, they oh. do, there's a bunch of different Coffee Break podcasts in lots of different languages and I find it um, a really fun one and engaging one. Do they speak it in Italian? They do both. So that's what I oh, like. Wow. They'll, they'll have a conversation in Italian and then they'll break it down into segments and kind of go through to explain what they're talking about. And so they go back and forth and it's, it's, it's been pretty good. Interesting. Yeah, it's fun. Kristen, for you, what's yours? Mm -hmm. Well, truthfully, the streaming device that's on the most is the Disney service with my three young children. But now that I'm commuting back into the city and have a long commute from Long Island, I am getting some mommy time and I'm all over the map. I like on Netflix, anything from some documentary type series to Broad Church to the Queen's Gambit, um, really all over the place. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it there. I'm always open to new ideas. Put them in the chat. I need to build a list. <laughs> Two hours, door to door. I have a lot to, to cover. <laughs> yes, you do. Is that over to me? Yep. Uh, well, also love the Queen's Gambit, so always happy to talk about that one. In terms of podcasts, I listen to Happier by Gretchen Rubin and her sister quite often, um, mostly while I cook. And I like it because it just gives you a second to think about very small tips and tricks to make your life happier. Um, one thing I've implemented is 21 and 21. So you come up with 20 th 21 things that are attainable throughout the year. Um, and then, you know, they do various episodes where you, you track against your 21. So it's been, it's been a fun way to just kind of take a break and yet still be productive in a happy way. That's great. Alexandra. From my side, I'm going to give a bit of an out of the box answer. I'm not a big TV person. Um, I do watch various streaming shows, but probably a little bit more um, outside of the professional realm. So from my side, I've become very passionate about yoga during the pandemic. And my yoga teacher has started a live stream of yoga. So this is where I spend most of my time. And it's allowed me to really increase my practice. So from attending, say, an in-person class one or two times a week, now with scheduling, I can actually practice five or six times a week. So the streaming has really allowed me to take it to the next step. Good for you. So for me, I would say probably my favorite show right now is Dancing with the Stars. And yes, I did used to dance when I was younger, but I think what I really love about that show is it gives people the chance from all over the map, the opportunity to step outside their comfort zone, let some magic happen and really challenge themselves. And I love watching these people develop and really push themselves in new and different ways. So I, I really love that. And maybe for just one second icebreaker question. And I have to say, I have to be honest, this is a question I ask anybody when I'm interviewing um, on both sides of the table. But if you could have dinner with any person living or dead, who would it be and why? So Linda, we'll start with you. So since I'm starting first, I had two choices just in case somebody also said Michelle. <laughs> um, so yeah, Michelle Obama to me is just such a remarkable individual. And I just think it would be so interesting to be able to sit down and really kind of hear the things that she can't say publicly, um, you know, and hear about, you know, how, how does she maintain composure in situations where I'm sure like there's steam coming out of her ears and she's probably so angry or upset, you know, about in a situation she just, oh, you know, had to stay poised and balanced and whatnot. So it's Michelle for me. And Kristen. Yeah, I think um, for me, it's like more personal. The first person that would come to mind is my grandmother's, my mother's mother, who I never got a chance to meet and, and 
for a lot of obvious reasons, just I'm really curious and would love to sit down with her to talk anything about family recipes to, you know, her time growing up and her experiences and things that she's been through that my family has experienced on that side. But um, yeah. Allie. I should have done what Linda did and came up with too, because mine was also <laughs> my mother's mo mother, who I did get to know uh, for a bit. She passed when I was in, in college, so I did get to learn certain things from her, but I have so many questions now that I wish she was here for. So similarly, it would be my, my grandmother. From my side, I would love to have dinner with Greta Th uh, Thunberg. Uh, the child activist, I would yeah. be, as I've focused my career on sustainability over the last few years, this is a topic that I've become quite passionate about personally, and I'd be very curious to understand how she became so passionate at such a young age, and then how she was able to energize um, such a large group of followers and get time with global leaders across the world. It's really quite amazing. So I think from a leadership perspective, there's a lot to learn from her. That's great. Um, for me, it's it's also a little personal. I would love to have dinner with Saint Joseph. Um, you know, Saint Joseph as the earthly father for Jesus, and I think there's so many reasons, not the least of which is he is the patron saint of workers. But for me, what I really find remarkable is how an earthly person could lead and guide someone who was destined for such greatness and still be very relevant not only in Jesus's life, but in the rest of, of lives of so many others. So I think that's a remarkable position to be in. And I would love to ask him some leadership questions and how he handled that situation. I think it's something that I could really learn a lot from. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over now to the topic of ESG. And I think it makes sense to start with some foundational questions. And you know, we'd like to encourage members in the audience, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, if you want to send it to me in the chat box, I will try to monitor the chat box and ask on your behalf. So it's the options open to you, but we definitely want to encourage engagement and involvement in the conversation. Um, so the first question, Alexandra, what is ESG? We all have heard the moniker, but could you explain what it is? Sure. So from my perspective, when I'm talking about ESG or environmental, social, and governance investing, I like to take it a, a bit broader and think about it more as sustainable investing as a concept. I think we as an industry have done a great job at overcomplicating something that's really quite simple. ESG or sustainable investing at its core is really just utilizing environmental, social, and governance information to get more from our investments. ESG allows us to better manage risk, it allows us to better uncover opportunity, and then it allows us to even help make positive change or positive impact. So I like to think about it as just getting the competitive financial return or financial alpha that we always have, but now also giving us the opportunity to help drive or create environmental and social alpha with our investments. And, and Linda, you know, do you have anything that you'd like to add on this point, thinking about it from market trends or geography and Maybe if you could touch a little bit on what this means in terms of guidelines and what does it mean geography wise, Europe versus the US? Yeah, so as Alexandra said, um, the industry has done a really good job at confusing things. Um, and, and I guess the word of caution to everyone is there are so many terms and acronyms thrown out in the marketplace that it's really important to understand if somebody's using ESG or sustainability, what do they really mean from it? Because the same use, uh, same same uh, definitions are used for different terms and vice versa. So that's one of the things that's caused confusion. Um, so that the from a market perspective, when you look at the headline numbers, um, they show 35 trillion in global sustainable assets under management. So around the world, and that was a 15% increase from 2018. That number is as of the beginning of 2020. Um, there's an organization called the Global Sustainable uh, Investment Review that puts out this report every two years um, that you might want to reference for more information. Um, and so the way they categorize, like what makes up that 35 trillion are a variety of different categories. So as Alexandra said, really at its core is this idea of 
evaluating environmental social governance issues as they may impact an investment right that's just good investment management you want to factor in all of those issues um, as you're evaluating a particular investment um, but that category from this group also in so it includes the e what they called esg integration um, but it also includes exclusions exclusions have really been the start of um, maybe call it used to be called socially responsible investing Right. I don't want any alcohol. I don't want any tobacco. I don't want firearms, etc. in my portfolio. So exclusions is another category. Um, there's also sustainable um, thematic like Alexandra is talking. She works on a thematic team and she was doing work on water. Right. That's a theme could be single theme and there could be multi theme portfolios. Um, and then um, there's also this idea of stewardship and engagement. So owners, investors are engaging with companies to try to affect positive change on a whole variety of these issues. Um, so, so that whole category. So when you hear 35 trillion, it's a really big number. Um, it's important to dimension what's really made up, uh, what it's made up of. The bulk of it is in integration and exclusions. Um, and when and you talk the, about, yeah. you know, when you talk about, and, and Alexander talk about, you know, evaluating investments for these factors. What about a company that doesn't have investments? What, what does it, how does a company think about ESG for themselves just in a, in a brief way? Yeah, so I mean, a company is on the other side, right? So if you're right. an investor, you're going to invest in a company. And, you know, I know we're going to talk a little bit about disclosures and, and everything in a little bit, but companies uh, need to take a look at themselves. And even when I was at Alliance Bernstein, I said, we if we're asking companies that we invest in to do certain things, we need to take a look at ourselves. So every organization really needs to look at their organization to understand, you know, what what's what's what are the material environmental social issues that can impact my business, um, and that I impact as an entity, right? It's kind right. of both ways. Um, and I I would just say governance issues are probably a bit more universal. Um, so I don't know, Alexandra, did you want to add something to that? Sure. So I think, um, to your point, what are the material issues? And I think more and more corporates or companies are recognizing that ES and G issues are material to how they are running their businesses. So if we think about a financial services company, it's very important to understand how a financial services company is retaining its employees, how it's addressing things such as inclusion and diversity, because a company that has lower turnover is going to have lower costs associated to managing its own human capital. That impacts the bottom line. But then it can even impact opportunity from my perspective. So thinking about long term, as we transition to a lower carbon economy, companies that are evolving their businesses to help provide solutions in this matter, say battery storage, for example, as we make that transition. These types of companies providing those solutions are really well positioned for long-term demand support. And if they fail to evolve, they actually might see less demand in the future. So as the world changes, so do, so do the corporates need to change. Yeah, I think that that that's a really good way to summarize it. Um, and then I think one other piece of information that could be important to this audience, there is an organization called the Principles of Responsible Investing that came out in 2006. It was um, really driven by the UN Secretary General in in um, collaboration with many large asset owners. Um, and they came up with six principles, the, the key one being for signatories to agree to integrate ESG into their investment process. Um, and then part of that also as a signatory, you're required to report on it. So it's not really just a check the box activity. They really are looking for commitment and you get scored. Um, so I think that that was kind of the earlier trend, I think, because people saw it more from, particularly asset managers saw it's like a commercial imperative that you had to be a PRI signatory because people just wanted to see a check on an RFP. And now I think it is really becoming um, a, a much more um, accepted way. And I think now that people understand what it really is, it, it's really hard to argue that that isn't a good way to run your business, whether you're an asset manager or a corporate. And maybe, Linda, if you could touch on briefly, the differences on this topic between where Europe is and the US is, I think there's sort of a, 
a, a difference in this geography wise and i don't want to say your thunder but maybe you could touch on this Sure. Um, so Europe has been leading the charge from a regulatory perspective. Um, they have um, a sustainable finance regulation uh, kind of framework, if you will, um, and it impacts both corporates and asset managers. Um, what they've tried to do is focus on better disclosure, and there's there's I'll, I'll touch on a very high level on three main components because it. It's very complicated and things be a are rabbit hole um you know so so one piece of it is something called the green taxonomy and think about that as, as kind of a, a dictionary or a reference guide on how to on how an organization can classify certain activities it, this also is primarily focused on environmental issues first um, things like climate change mitigation, protection, you know, and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. So it's this taxonomy that organizations are going to have to report uh, against. Um, another aspect is SFDR. So let me tell you, there's no shortage of acronyms. I said it before, and I'm not kidding. Um, so that is the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Um, it went into effect earlier this year, but I'm hearing that it's sort of on hold because um, it, it ended up being quite complicated. So the goal with that was for asset managers to provide more information to investors on their funds. So they had to classify their funds in different categories based on the level of whether it's ESG integration or it had a very specific ESG goal to it. Um, and so I think once they started the exercise, people realized how difficult it was. Um, and then the other piece is the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, and this is probably one example because uh, I guess one key example of how Europe is different from the US at this point. Um, Europe has really taken uh, what we call a double bottom line approach. So yes, you need financial disclosure, but they're really through regulation pushing sustainability disclosure to be required as well. Um, and so the CSRD requires a company to report on the impact of their activities on the environment and society, whether it's, you know, uh, employee health and wellness, you know, the impact to their customers, impact to their communities. Um, so, so that's sort of the high level pieces. Um, in the US, what we've seen is the SEC, you mentioned in your comments, opening comments, how the SEC is um, opening up to allow shareholders um, to get more propo shareholder proposals on the um, uh, ballots. But um, they're also, their key agenda items this year are on disclosure. So climate disclosure, number one, cyber disclosure, as well as DEI disclosure. Um, we'll see We'll see how far that goes. From what I've read and what I've seen, it's still through the lens of materiality. So not the double bottom line where the European Union is saying, I want to know what the impact of your activities are on society, as well as your financial the SEC at this point is still taking a, a materiality lens. And there again, anybody else on the team want to jump in and, and add to that, please do. Thank you for that, Linda. And I, you know, I think we could keep going and spend the whole time on just ground and framework, but what I'd like to do is orient the conversation so we can touch briefly on what this may mean first from a portfolio management perspective, then from a sales perspective, and then maybe over to a risk perspective. So Alexandra, if we could turn over to you, I'm, I'm curious, can you talk about how rating agencies evaluate ESG portfolio construction and ESG commitment? Sure. So I would say the two biggest, um, there are, are numerous rating agencies out there in the sustainability space, but I'll, I'll speak to the two biggest in this space, MSCI and Sustainalytics, and those are, are some of which we leverage as an investment team today. So at the, at the core, when we're making our investment decisions, 
MSCI and Sustainalytics are effectively helping us to have a greater understanding of how each and every company is managing their own environmental, social, and governance practices, and then assigning materiality on these issues as it relates to the underlying sector or industry that the company is a part of. So different sectors are going to have different material issues relevant to them, and their reporting allows us to have all that information in one place where we can then go and do a bit of a deeper dive on some of the potential issues or even some of the potential opportunities as I was just discussing. And I would say this is important. The ESG ratings providers provide a really good first glance at information, but because the industry is still evolving and still so new, and because we don't have accepted terms, the correlation in the ratings that these industry, um, the, the ESG industry providers are giving is still quite low. So. Mm -hmm. The correlation in scores from the two biggest providers, the MSCI and the Sustainalytics, is only a 0.2. And if you compare that to, say, credit ratings, Moody's and S&P, that correlation is closer to a 0.9. Wow. So a lot of work still needs to be done from our perspective as investors to use this as a starting point and then gain additional understanding based on our overall view of a particular company. Now, outside of this, these rating agencies are also helping um, say financial advisors and end investors better understand how a particular investment strategy or fund is managing their sustainability risks and what their sustainability objectives are. I would say the most popular scoring is from Morningstar in this case, and Morningstar actually partnered with Sustainalytics not too long ago, um, and they are assigning a globe rating to funds. And basically what that means is company, or I'm sorry, strategies or funds that have a five globe rating or a high globe rating are considered to be the most sustainable. But again, it's just a starting point because it is relative to the funds within, um, it, within the fund peer group. So giving a starting point, getting um, investors to better understand what they may be getting themselves into. Because to Linda's earlier point, sustainability can mean so many different things and has so many different inputs and outputs. Gotcha. And when I've been reading about this in, in the Wall Street Journal, and even other publications, one term that I see a lot of is greenwashing and the SEC focusing on greenwashing or certain asset managers getting dinged for greenwashing. W what is that and why should people care about that? Sure. So I think greenwashing is happening and greenwashing is really just the, the, the means of, say, over promising on the sustainability of a particular fund or even say how a corporate is managing its own sustainability practices and not delivering on those promises. So saying that you're having a big impact um, on the environment or on society or as a corporate uh, making certain claims and not having data to back them up. And I think we're in this position because we don't have industry accepted terms today. So in the long run, I think we will um, move away from greenwashing. But at this point, it's very important to explain what you mean by your sustainable promises so you can avoid greenwashing and then have proof points to back up whatever you are promising. And asset managers are taking much more um, attention on this matter lately. And I think a lot of the regulation, such as what Linda described, is going to help um, move us forward in the space. And from a portfolio construction perspective, how Aaron, do you think, uh, sure, I, please, I, jump in, go ahead. Just because it relates to that comment, because I, th I think it's important for folks to know, uh, I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but the SEC created a climate and ESG task force earlier this year to focus on those points that um, Alexandra just spoke about. And the interesting thing is it's under their enforcement division. So I think both issuers in terms of what they're saying about what they're doing, there's an eye there, and there's also an eye to the asset managers who are out there saying, oh yeah, we have sustainable funds and we do this and that, the eye is on both. Yeah, and I, I know that certainly in some of my conversations with portfolio managers, they've mentioned the SEC being in and asking questions, even if there aren't regulations to measure them against, but they're already asking questions as they're in for their exams, for sure. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up. So um, Alexandra, I'm sorry, back to you in terms of how do you consider ESG when you're constructing a portfolio and in what ways can ESG help create a better portfolio with better returns? Sure, so it's gonna go back to that risk and opportunity. So when we go through our, our traditional due diligence, we're gonna look at traditional fundamental factors just as we always have, but we wanna have a clear picture of where a company is going and where a company is today. 
And today intangibles account for nearly 80% of a company's value. And a lot of those intangibles are actually ESG factors or how a company is managing its environmental, social and governance practices. So I like to think about ESG information as helping us to complete say the equity puzzle for lack of a better term. There are additional puzzle pieces that allow us to see the future more clearly to avoid a potential risk. So a technology company that has a cybersecurity risk that's having data leaks of customer information, that's gonna have an impact on the bottom line. And then thinking again about that long-term opportunity as it relates to water, companies helping us solve water scarcity, which is one of the top risks we face as a global society. Those companies providing solutions are really well positioned for long-term demand support. So it's additional information off balance sheet that we can consider as investors in the portfolio construction process. Great, thank you. And you know, if we turn our eye a little bit from a sales perspective, so we sort of talked about what the foundation is, a little bit about regulatory, a little bit about how this factors into building a portfolio. You know, the next step that I think of naturally from a flow perspective is sales. So Kristen, thinking about this for you, how has ESG changed in client conversations that you've seen in the past few years? Sure, and maybe some of this might seem obvious now based on some of Linda's comments and Alex's as well, but obviously our counterparts in Europe have been ahead of the trend. That regulation that Linda has spoken to has then sort of forced the hand of institutions to really take a closer look and start implementing ESG into their portfolios probably well before here in the United States. Now that said, I think, you know, Alex and others can probably chime in on, we have seen tremendously a lot more flows from Morningstar data, from other data points into sustainable type funds over the past couple of years. So it's becoming more, not just a topic of conversation, but really how are folks looking at it? How are they going to implement it? So really there's a wide spectrum from retail investors to institutional. And of course, any institutional investor, which might be global in nature, might also be a step ahead of the curve as they're looking at their portfolios based on SFDR regulations and already incorporating some of those metrics into their overall asset allocations. But you know, I think it's a journey and I think that we're getting there. And certainly it's a part of every conversation now um, from soup to nuts, where a couple of years ago, I wouldn't say that was necessarily the case. And do you find it's a different conversation depending on whether it's an institutional client or a retail client? Does the age of the client sometimes have a factor on the direction of the conversation? Sure, I think there's different complexities based on the type of client you're looking at. Um, okay. Maybe a more retail client or even younger generation client ultimately wants to align their values with their investments. And that's personal choices that they're making when they're thinking about what they're gonna incorporate into their portfolios. When you're looking at institutional investors, they have anything from some of these regulations that were spoken about, or even the DOL, when you're thinking about the retirement space in terms of the ESG considerations that they're talking about now, and how as a fiduciary, they're looking to implement that into their plan sponsor lineups and how is that affected by governance and how is that understood by plan participants? And honestly, I mean, with all of the different terminologies, there's also the idea of how do you evaluate portfolio managers and asset managers in this space when there's a lot of different tools, there's a lot of different rating agencies. So, um, I'm kind of spitting a lot out there, but I think again, going back to being a retail investor and maybe younger generation, it could be anything from aligning your values to all the different types of considerations you have to make along the spectrum um, when you're evaluating a portfolio management decision and how it makes it into your overall asset allocation. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of a very broad conversation that can go in many directions. Maybe it would be helpful if you could take a specific example of, say, perhaps a retirement client, and particularly a retirement client that's younger. How does the ESG factor into their decisioning process, and how might you help them figure out what are the best products to help support what their goals are? Sure. So maybe just building on that DOL point, I think you know, with different administrations, these things adjust. Um, ever so slightly, but I was looking at something today that talked about how the DOL was clarifying that ESG should be a consideration um, in a fiduciary's 
lineup. And then not only should it be an economic consideration, but it also sort of um, gives you the impression that if you're not considering it, what do you have to justify to say why you're not considering ESG as a part of your lineup? So some of what we've done with our clients is talking to those retirement plans and they have to think about it from their investment policy statement, for example. How are they going to change and adapt that to include ESG? How are they going to evaluate their managers? And this is like a journey that we help sort of take them on. How then do they help to educate their plan participants in you know, choosing from not only now this lineup of different asset classes, but ones that now have ESG considerations? And I think, you know, again, going back to the fact that it's it's partnering with these clients to help them along that journey to make sure that everybody is taking into all of these different considerations along the way. Great, thank you. And, you know, Ali, if we turn over to you and we think about some of this from a risk perspective, Linda mentioned earlier in the conversation exclusion lists. Can you talk about how they're developed and specifically around defense and munitions but then I'm also wondering if you can talk about what, how this comes into play when you may have broad global organization exclusion lists, and then how does that impact perhaps a subsidiary that may have a different view and how does that all work together? Sure, so a lot of what I focus on on the operational risk side is really how we're going to implement the various um, topics as it relates to ESG. So one thing with exclusion lists is, um, like Linda mentioned, a, a, a client may have their own exclusion list, maybe based on their um, investment policy statement, maybe they don't want to be in tobacco or alcohol, for example. Um, if we think about something like cluster munitions or firearms, um, a lot of these, these lists, you know, you can buy um, from different firms. A lot of firms do decide to, to outsource that because it's hard to keep up um, the, and maintain these lists, you know, different firms do different things at different times. And so if we think about something like firearms um, for, so as a, a global asset management organization, you might think that that is very cut and dry that you would exclude firearms or, you know, munitions from your, uh, from your investments. But then if you turn that over and think about the US, for example, that means that you would have to exclude firms like Lockheed Martin or Raytheon, which are big names here in the US that I don't think you necessarily want to exclude from a fiduciary perspective. Also, depending if you're on your firm, they might even be a client where you might be managing money for them. So it's really important when you're rolling out an exclusion list broadly um, as an asset management firm to really consider how it's going to impact not only the ESG perspective, but also make sure that the investment makes sense from a portfolio perspective. Great, thank you. And you know, certainly we've seen over the past year companies making more and more statements on perhaps the S aspect of ESG. But if we think about E, S, and G more broadly, and statements companies make in very public forums, how do how do you, how does an organization need to think about that from? the statements they're making, how to prove compliance with it, how to track it, because while there may not be regulation in the states doing that now, at, at some point there will be, if not regulation, then certainly the public awareness of it and calling out companies, which is also becoming more popular. So maybe you could touch on that aspect a little bit. Absolutely. And I think this is a really important aspect when companies are thinking, you know, what they become a signatory to or what they say the firm is going to do is is that all coming from a centralized team? So, it, you know, is there one specific team that's saying that we're gonna do this and are they tracking everything that we've agreed to? Is there a centralized point where you can look and say everything that the firm has signed up for? And then importantly, how are you actually going to track what you, that you say, you did what you say you're gonna do? So if you agree to do certain types of training, who's tracking, when it occurred, what is in the training. Um, you don't want to be caught out that you've said that you're going to do something and that you didn't. And also, can you actually track it? Is the data there and available for the firm to be able to track it? Which is something you want to think about before you sign on for something. Um, but sometimes sounds simple, but when you actually dig into the data that's available, it might not be. 
Um, so although something sounds great and you want to sign off on it and it's very important from to the firm from an ESG perspective, are you going to be able to do what you say that you're doing? Or prove that you did what you said you do. Exactly. Yeah, not always so easy. And can you talk about how an organization can develop an approach to non-governmental organization and the demands that may come along from those NGOs? Certainly. So from a reputational risk perspective, NGOs are constantly coming after different asset management firms. And really, a lot of times there's no winning. So if you agree to do something, perhaps you didn't go far enough. Or if you're not agreeing to do something, why didn't you agree to do it? So it's really important that the firm decides what its stance is and why it's chosen to go as far as it has or not go as far as it has and be comfortable with that and be able to respond to any kind of media requests or any kind of um, response from an NGO because it's, it's all about a balance and finding what's right for the firm as opposed to one extreme or the other. Yeah, I mean, I know certainly on the not-for-profit board that I sit on, we have certain members coming with these very long list of demands and something that we're grappling with is what is our position what do we feel comfortable responding to and being able to do it in a sustainable way that meets the objective, but that's also able to even be done? Absolutely. Implementation it, is it a really key. hard. It really can be. And implementation is going to be a key for everything that a firm decides to, to do from an ESG perspective. It needs to be considered at the onset rather than after we've decided that we want to do something going forward. Yeah, once the horse is out of the barn, the horse is out of the barn. <laughs> exactly. It's generally not catching. Um, so Linda, you know, thinking about some, some hot topics, you know, climate, supply chain management, oh my God, the, you know, we're all impacted by supply chain management and what it means in so many different ways, um, or DE and I, can you talk about any one of these and what your views are on them? Because they're also very important from an ESG perspective. Yeah, so maybe before I jump into um, kind of the key topics today, because I think it comes back to a theme that we've had in our conversations today, which is around disclosure and data and standards, because uh -huh. um, there was a really important announcement that came out yesterday. Um, and it was it was announced during COP by the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, to add to your acronym list. <laughs> um, and it, it was the announcement was about the formation of the ISSB, which is the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, and what if I, it, the, the wording was a little bit vague, but um, anyway, what, what, what I think what they're trying to do is consolidate other existing disclosure groups into this new board. Mm -hmm. um, so some of you might have heard of SASB, that's, that's a more common term, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. Um, that group was founded in 2011 with the goal of identifying what issues are material, by industry so that investors can have kind of a standard, you know, reference. Um, and so uh, this new group, this ISSB is looking to pull the uh, value reporting foundation, which SASB is now a part of, um, under this umbrella, along with another standards board called the CDSB, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, under this one um, international sustainability standards boards with the main goal of coming up with global reporting standards, right? So why does it matter? You know, I think um, Alexandra can tell you very much. It's very hard to compare companies, even if they're in the same industry, because they're really, other than governance issues, there's a lacking of standard reporting metrics and data that um, right. that investors want to see. So yeah. comparability we, is really a challenge on this front at the moment in the U.S. for sure. Ab absolutely. And and I think, you know, we talked about it earlier, too. Like, why does all this matter? Why do standards matter? Well, yeah, it, it helps investors right make better investment decisions um it helps regulators but it it also ultimately i think is in the company's best interest to have standards because they're getting hit from so many different angles right all the different esg ratings agencies and you know other stakeholders they have nothing to point to 
Yeah, it's it's just it, it's it's very very resource intensive. I really have a lot of empathy for for corporates. Um, so, so I think one of the key issues, you know, even though it, it wasn't a you know a DEI or climate issue, but I think this idea of data and data standards. I think I'm I'm really excited. I hope the ISSB can get beyond politics and really, you know, get get down, uh, sit down and really, really get some some standards out to the market. They said they're going to start on climate. So clearly climate is, um, I think, the hottest topic. Um, but uh, I think now investors are seeing the impact that climate has on their operations. And obviously, they're getting more pressure to understand what they're contributing to climate as well. And I don't I don't see that going away anytime soon. Um, there are these groups, depending on what your business is, um, called the Net Zero Alliance. So it could be the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, Net Zero Asset Manager Alliance, right? Everybody trying to drive to net zero by 2050. So climate is not going away. Um, let's hope even we can on, even on this. Yeah, even on this point that you're bringing up, Linda, you know, from my perspective and conversations that I'm having with different individuals, as the different regulators or regulatory bodies or groups that are being formed are coming up with this regulation, you know, my sense is these regulatory disclosure requirements coming down the pike at some point I have an impression and a feeling that it could hit organizations more than SOX hit organizations way back when. And I think many of us that are on the call, not to date us all, but I think a lot of us remember what happened when SOX hit organizations and the scramble that was there to know if you were SOX compliant, prove you were SOX compliant, do the reporting. I think regulatory disclosure and proof around this is gonna be even bigger than SOX, but I'm curious on, on your impression. Um, it, it's hard to say whether it's going to be, at, you know, as big or equal to socks. I do, I do think, um, I do think it, it is going to be um, big, though, right? I think you see companies now already starting to scramble, right, mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, how are they going to report? Organizations are getting involved in more industry organizations in the U.S. Honestly, it wasn't that long ago, five years ago. You know, I would have an ESG conversation with a corporate, and they would say, "What are you talking about? You know, we, you know, this is not this is not important to our business." Um, and so now, I think just from so many constituents and so many stakeholders mm -hmm. that um, they're realizing it's important, but ultimately those who are going to win in the end are those who realize that this is just good business. Um, and so the, 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 the issue, the challenge is going to be, how do you do it in a way that, you know, is the most efficient, is the most effective? Um, and so, yeah, I think we've seen, you know, all the regulation that we've talked about, there's going to be a lot of, you got the proof, the proof is in the pudding, pudding you know, or the pudding, whatever that saying is, right? Yeah. You, you, you really have to make sure that you can prove um, that what you say you are doing, you are really doing, and that is going to take some resource. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I think, you know, maybe a little bit what might be different is at least if we go back to SOX timeframes, internal controls, and in theory, that was all getting done or should have been getting done. And perhaps it was a little bit easier to find the information, to gather the information, even if we didn't have the systems to do it. It may be that with ESG, maybe it's it's harder because what is the information that needs to be gathered? And maybe it's the type of information that doesn't sit anywhere yet. So you've got to find out where it is, create the systems to gather it and track it, accumulate it and gather it. So I think it could be challenging. And I see a question coming in for the chat box and I'll, I'll post this for the whole panel, but does anybody have a view on the idea of using blockchain to track metrics, especially in the E category slash supply chain? So I open that up to anybody, if anybody has a view. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll respond. I mean, I think, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's a really interesting idea. I think the use of blockchain in general for any process should be thought of. And I think there will be a lot of processes that move to blockchain. The idea of blockchain and the fact that that would be sort of open architecture for capturing it, is there a way to do that across all industries? I'm not sure, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's not a FinTech out there somewhere thinking of that as a solution, seeing that these requirements are gonna be coming down the pike. 
I think just to add to that, uh, Aaron, on the blockchain, one of the one of the benefits is you can track the source of whatever you're talking about. So if you're talking about, you know, agriculture, you can actually trace where those tomatoes have been grown and how it kind of goes through the whole supply chain. I think that's one of the benefits of having that blockchain technology to kind of be able to uh, identify is that crop being cultivated in a in a, in a sustainable fashion. Yeah, um, and if not, you know, uh, what are we going to do about it? I, I had a separate question, and I think Linda, you touched on it. Um, you said, you know, ESG is just good for business, and that kind of makes sense to me too. But when you think about, you know, what what <clears throat> maybe recently we've seen on on Facebook, for example, where you know some of the issues popping up around what the uh, the whistleblower kind of claimed out there, and then the organization going out to defend what they were doing. There's saying something and there's action and would love to get your perspective. And then when you think about from Alexander's perspective, when you think about portfolio construction, how do you think about Facebook as, is that a client that you should be in your portfolio? It's big enough that most managers would say, yeah, I need to have it in there, but is it operating in a, in a uh, ESG fashion. Well, I'll take the first half of your question and then I'll pass it over to Alexandra. I, I think you bring up a really important point, which is how do you hold firms accountable for what they say they're doing or what they want to do versus what they're actually doing? And I think that there is just much more heightened focus on that. And I don't, I, I think that that focus is going to continue. Um, I think a couple of years ago, it was 2019 when the Business Roundtable um, amended its statement of purpose, right? And basically said, you know, companies aren't in business just for their shareholders holders um companies are in business oops somebody's sharing their screen not yeah. sure you want to do that uh, <laughs> yeah, like, on what we should all be investing in is that the exact right blockchain technology um but you know i think when the business roundtable came out and said you know companies aren't in business just for sh uh, shareholders they're in business for all stakeholders right their employees their communities etc suppliers etc um i think that that created a tremendous amount of skepticism and that is driving more people to hold firms accountable um and aaron you made a comment before in terms of organizations taking a position i think more stakeholders are going to want to see companies taking a position one way or the other like tell me what you really think about something what you know what what do you think about you know human trafficking you know whatever whatever the topic is you know have a statement on what you think about it and what you're doing um and i think it's all going to tie back to action um and maybe one of the best examples right now that is kind of more immediate term uh, to track is DEI, right? So certainly with COVID and, and um, Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement, right? DEI has now finally gotten the attention it deserves. But the question is, companies can say it's important. And I know when I engaged with companies at AB, the question was, tell me what you're doing. What's your plan? What's your strategy? How are you tracking it? How do you know if you're making progress? Because it's not as it's not as simple as just saying, oh, yes, we're going to hire a more diverse workforce. But how, how are you going to do that? Right. Um, and so I, I just think more companies are going to be held accountable. At least I hope so. I don't want to take your thunder, Alex, because I know that you can go into this specific topic a lot, but I think engagement, we touched upon it earlier, but from a portfolio management perspective, from an asset owner perspective, engagement is a really big part of the conversation. Because if you're not an owner of a company, and of course the company has to be able to change and willing to do so, but if you're not an owner of that company, having a voice really tracking the company from a portfolio management perspective, and, and engaging with that management to make sure they are actually making those changes as an asset owner. I think that's where I know a bunch of our investment teams see a lot of benefit in this space. And I know Alex can definitely talk about that in much more detail. Sorry for jumping in. 
No problem. And thank you, Kristen, not for bringing that up. Very much agree. I think that we can use um, our position to really shape positive change and we can essentially help be a part of the transition to a more sustainable world, addressing both environmental and social issues using our ownership position, whether it's having that in person or in this case, virtual dialogue as we've been having during COVID or perhaps even using our um, votes and how we vote our proxies to align with environmental and social initiatives. And that can really help um, drive positive change. And if you're voting against a company management proposal, they're likely to come back and ask why and want to understand more. And that opens the door for us to even engage on broader issues outside of the one where we started the initial conversation. So a lot of positive change can happen there for sustainable strategies, but then even for more mainstream strategies. This is something that we're doing across the board and we feel is very important. Um, but maybe just to address the, the question on Facebook, and I think that's a great one and one that's um, a company that's highly debated, I would say, within our, our own firm in terms of how sustainable is Facebook? Should we be owning Facebook from a sustainability perspective? From my side, it really depends on what the aim of the underlying fund or strategy is. What is the sustainability aim? What is the sustainability promise? If a, an investor or a fund manager is just using ESG information to be better informed about risk and opportunity with no sustainable outcome promise involved, then if that fund manager feels that those risks are priced in, to the company at the time of entering the position, then that's fine. They're aware this is information that they now have at their fingertips to inform the overall risk reward profile of the company. That said, if the sustainable, if the fund has a sustainable objective, whether it's more of an impact focus or say focusing on companies that are leaders within their respective industries, and that's more of the aim of the strategy in addition to the financial goal, then that's one that there, there probably should be a little bit more time spent on and perhaps make a decision to pass on investing in a company like Facebook um, that does have larger um, ESG risks associated. So I'm, I'm curious and a question for all of the panelists and I, you just mentioned it briefly, Linda, COVID. Has COVID come into your conversations around for any of you in your roles as it relates to ESG? I'm curious you know, what you've experienced, what your views are on that. Seems like we can't have any conversation without COVID coming up somehow, some way. <laughs> so far be it for me to leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think a lot of conversation has um, accelerated due to COVID. Um, certainly a lot of conversations around workplace policies, um, worker safety, worker welfare, um, you know, organizations have, you know, had to really pivot very quickly. Um, but this idea of having greater responsibility for your employees, I think, became very evident um, during COVID. So I think that that's one aspect. I think from an issuer perspective, a lot of issuers had to accelerate some of their strategies if they wanted to stay relevant you know when we've seen that with you know a huge switch you know to online shopping as an example for a lot of retail stores you know those that couldn't pivot so well you know didn't do as well um mm. and then i think the third um point i'll talk about is just from an environmental perspective right when the world slowed down a little bit and um people you know in, in industries weren't producing as much we saw firsthand blue skies in areas of china and other parts of the world that had previously been brown or gray because of um you know the environmental impact so i think those three areas um are just you know three of of many others but i think three three key highlights So maybe just a, another question for the group here. Um, you know, your thoughts on where ESG is going and the most pressing topics you're dealing with in, in your functions. And maybe we could just go Linda, Kristen, Allie, or maybe we'll start with Alexandra. I, I know you have another engagement. I'm grateful that you were able to stay on as long as you have. So maybe we'll start Alexandra and then go to, go to the rest of the panelists. Sure. So from my perspective, I would say that I think ESG is going to be a part of 
I think the terminology ESG will change over time because I think that ESG is doing good business. I think ESG is necessary to be a responsible and good investor. We need to consider these factors. So at the baseline going forward, every single investment strategy is going to consider environmental, social, and governance information, and maybe that label goes away. But where I think the asset management industry will likely move is continue to evolve and create new strategies more on the impact investing side of things. So ESG will be a part of the core portfolio and there'll be more and more opportunity to have a satellite exposure to various impact investments that are a bit more um, specific to underlying goals. So I, I look forward to seeing more innovation in the space in this place. And I do think um, on the corporate side of things as well, disclosure is only going to help us um, achieve more in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, Linda. Um, yeah, I think Alexandra really, really hit it on the head. I, I completely agree with all her comments. Um, I guess maybe what I would add to that is don't be surprised if some of the headline numbers go down before they go back up, because with this intense focus, um, regulatory focus and, and disclosure and prove what you're doing. We saw that in the European numbers. They went down um, from 2018 to 2020. Um, and, and part of that was attributed to the tighter, you know, definitions and the regulatory framework. Um, so I, I definitely think we, we will see that. And um, yeah, I think, I think uh, Alexander just hit the other issues on the head. Thank you. Um, Kristen, your thoughts? I mean, I only expect to see more sustainable strategies in all client portfolios from retail to institutional. I think the momentum is there. And, and while there might be some hiccups along the way, I think that folks are only going to continue to implement these from their, you know, personal retirement accounts up to the pension funds of all of the different states that we manage money for. Um, and that's an exciting thing. And I think that's an important thing. We've seen that it's not something that impacts portfolio returns. It, if anything, only helps to enhance them and further governance from a risk perspective. So um, right. I think we'll continue to see more. And, and Ali, from a risk perspective, I would imagine there's even more coming down the pike on the topic of ESG as it relates to the risk functions. But what are some of the hot topics that you see coming down the down the pike sure i mean data like we've discussed i think is going to be a huge one of how do you actually get the data that you're looking for how do you assess the ratings of the various agencies what do you decide to use etc um and the other one that i don't know that we've we've talked much about is um i think suitability is going to come up down the road as well so i don't think regulators have focused on it much but you know we hear esg uh, particularly as it comes to retail clients, are they do are they knowledgeable enough to be in an impact fund? And you know, are the advisors doing their due diligence? Yeah, the risks make... enough. Exactly. I think that's yeah. going to come down the pike. Although I don't think yeah. we're we're there yet. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that, but but you're absolutely right. Um...